So hello and welcome. I'm Ryan Fong, one of the co-founders and organizers of Undisciplining the Victorian Classroom. Hopefully you all have had the chance to listen to some of our other Zoom casts and know that these are meant to be a space to stage conversations uh, with one another in order for us to think together about our classroom practices and about our processes of learning and unlearning as teachers. As with all of our content on UVC, our goal is to grow and learn together as a community of scholars, especially as we take up the challenge of moving beyond the boundaries of our field and training to address uh, issues of race and racism in our field and in our classrooms. This is the fourth Zoomcast in our positionality cluster, which features conversations with scholars who are trained in Victorian studies and explores how we might undiscipline Victorian studies as a way to inspire new modes of anti-racist teaching in our classroom spaces. Please note that the reflections here in this conversation come from our personal experiences. We don't intend to speak on behalf of others and are sharing from the position of our own identities, bodies, institutional locations, and backgrounds as a way to spark thought and discussion. So today I'm thrilled to be joined with Lorenzo Servite, uh, Associate Professor of Literature and Medicine at Lehigh University. Lorenzo is the author of Medicine is War, the Martial Metaphor in Victorian Literature and Culture, which came out with SUNY Press last year. And I'm really excited to be talking with him about his work in the history of science and medicine and how this subfield can play an important role in us undisciplining our classrooms and curricula, especially in the COVID era. So thank you so much for joining us today, Lorenzo, and, and welcome to UVC. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you for the introduction and for that uh, wonderful preface to your podcast. <laughs> Great. Um, so just to get things started here, can you maybe talk a little bit about your entry points into Victorian studies as a field and maybe more specifically the history of science and medicine in the Victorian period of the 19th century? I came into grad school um, not knowing what I wanted to study literary wise. I just knew I wanted to study medical things. Um, and I had this kind of, um, ha having studied uh, exercise physiology and English in my undergrad and, and being unsure what I wanted to do, um, I ended up finding out that there was this um, scholar at UC Riverside named Susan Zeger uh, who wrote this book called Inventing the Addict, uh, Race, Gender, and Sexuality in American British and British Literature in the 19th Century. And I happened to be working at a, a gym at the time at the, as a fitness instructor. Um, at um, that was at a drug and alcohol rehabil rehabilitation clinic. So that ended up being the kind of serendipitous entry point where I saw that I could learn and study and uh, uh, research medical things in a kind of literary capacity. Um, and that's kind of how I got started. Um, my first two years, I didn't really nail down what I wanted to do. I just wrote about medical things in whatever kind of seminar I wanted to, uh, whatever seminar I was in. Um, and when I finally had to choose a period, I hadn't read a Victorian novel since, since I don't know when, um, and actually wasn't really necessarily that fond of it, uh, of, of the literature. Um, and in fact, I had um, actually actively avoided a class by Joe Childers on Dickens because it was like notorious for having to read Bleak House in a week and stuff. Um, but I ended up choosing my uh, field uh, based on the period, and I wanted to think about what did I, what time period did I find most interesting in terms of the history of science and medicine. And um, I think it's not hard to make a case that it was the 19th century. And that's kind of how I got steered toward the period. And the more I started looking into it and the more I went beyond um, just kind of being wowed by uh, Susan's book and really looking at um, the different um, dimensions um, in terms of uh, place that she was looking at, because her text is actually, um, it, um, but her monograph is both on American and British literature. Mm -hmm. I kind of got drawn more toward uh, the British side. And that's when I kind of declared my field. And um, so I guess I would say I started with the history of science and medicine first, uh, and the literature aspect came second. Great. 
Yeah, I think um, there's several, actually several of us um, in the field of Victorian studies that were that have a similar not not through the history of science and, and medicine, but the kind of reluctant Victorianists that like we think uh -huh. we thought we hated this, and then and then suddenly like no, this is the thing. Um, so that was my own trajectory as well. Um, so oh, okay. yeah, so um, and I had a kind of a conversion moment in graduate school as well, and and uh, and so yeah, it's it's an interesting interesting way in. Um, I think. Uh, to Victoria's. Certainly there are plenty of those those who are, I'm sure, watching and listening um, that were- the, You didn't always love the, Middlemarch? Yeah, the, 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 Middlemarch, the died yeah. in the wool. Yeah, the died in the wool people. But um, but uh, yeah, there's there's also this alternate trajectory that I think is is more common than than um, than we sometimes admit, so. A reluctant um, Victorianist, let's make a good <laughs> series of essays. Great. Um, so um, Maybe I, you could talk a little bit about your book, um, which uh, just came out um, a few, actually probably more than a few months ago now um, from SUNY Press. Um, and also an essay I know that you wrote and had recently published too about, about Jekyll and Hyde. Um, and, oh, um, yeah, and so, um, so the, you know, the, this work that, that really is kind of, I think already kind of doing some of this undisciplining work, right? By like bridging fields and bringing liter literary studies into some of these other other fields um, uh, of knowledge and and um, and academic study. So, um, can you just talk a little bit about your research and and um, either in the book or or in the in the essay or both? Sure. Um, I'll I'll start just by talking a little bit about disciplinary boundaries per se. Um, I I guess I was always. I, I was drawn um, to Victorian studies, also in particular, I should say, because I always heard this notion of interdisciplinarity, uh, and you know, like it, particularly the journal. Like I just remember hearing it kind of like with Mystique and Seminar by the older graduate studies. Like you can't just write about a single novel, and it has to have some other kind of disciplinary uh, um, inflection or dimension. And I guess mm. I was always drawn to that idea and challenge, um, and so. When I started to work on my book um, in terms of literature, it, it actually grew out of an essay in Susan Zeger's class on Victorian media on Dracula. And I looked at how um, there was this metaphor of war kind of throughout Dracula, and Dracula was also described as a disease. So I just kind of put those two things together. And as that sort of developed into um, something that I inflected in other kind of seminar paper forms and eventually into a book manuscript, I started to really draw on different sources beyond, um, you know, of course, just readings of Dracula, and um, and I started looking at history of medicine as a field per se. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, like Christopher, uh, books by Christopher Lawrence and um, histories of public health, um, uh, Graham Mooney's uh, history of uh, surveillance, quarantine, and isolation, and I I started become this was became a really difficult space for me because I always found it challenging to kind of do justice to the medical history of things and then the literary study of things and that continues to be a challenge for me but something that um, I guess I'm always drawn by and then I guess to add another dimension to that is um, to take it beyond just literary scholars or interdisciplinary Victorian study scholars or medical historians over here, you have another group of health humanists or medical humanists um, who might be trained out of, out of medicine and have an interest in literature or an interest in history and try to um, appeal and make that argument interesting to them. Um, mm -hmm. So that's juggling all those different uh, audiences and discourses, um, drawing on STS and biopolitical theory, critical race theory, and once I started to get um, into um, uh, antibiotic work, I started to, to look much more at um, different kinds of uh, eco um, uh, environmental humanities and then uh, toxicology and environmental science. Um, so that juggling is is always been something I've I've been fond of. Um, but it, at the same time, it, it, it continually drives um, stress uh, and challenges and difficult readers' reports. Um, but even um, the, the most difficult of tensions sometimes, I think, produce good results. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and on this theme of, of interdisciplinarity, I mean, I think, um, you know, just knowing a little bit about you, at, you know, out, outside the Zoom cast, um, I mean, you have... You're somebody who I feel like it's like it's not just somebody who's interested in interdisciplinarity, like committed to it. Like you have 
double, triple, quadruple down. So um, <laughs> in, the, in the sense of like, not just trying to kind of dabble, which I think a lot of us literary critics do is like, okay, I'm gonna kind of learn and dabble in these other things and kind of bring this in. Um, I dabble, you're actually, I, yeah, I dabble, yeah. <laughs> you I'm sure we, you know, certainly dabble, but you also are like real commitment. So, um, so I understand that you're getting a master's in public health right now, yes. is that correct? Yes. So, I mean, yes, that, that's that's student, like, yeah. <laughs> you're a grad student again. I mean, that's that's like next level commitment here. So I'm just I'm just kind of curious to to hear you talk about the decision to do that um, and kind of some of the things that as you're working on that degree, like what you're, what the kinds of connections that you're seeing and the, the, the enhancements that you're seeing in this this discussion and this, this interdisciplinary nexus. Okay, great, because there are also not enhancements. There are things that like go wrong sometimes. Um, yes, so um, I, as I started to delve in my book and um, I in, uh, was really trying to do justice and do beyond dabbling in the history of medicine, when I was trying to speak to that health humanist audience and try to make it a little bit more relevant, um, at least in my afterward chapter and some of um, my other work, so I started looking to antibiotics um, in the 20th century, and then con in contemporary uh, medical discourse and um, health, public health. Um, I was often citing and looking at epidemiological studies to say, cite like in the back, like the incidence rate, uh, the mortality rate, and looking at all these different studies, and I was citing them. So I had an interesting experience about uh, medical uh, with a historian of medicine a while back ago when I was in grad school, when I was writing about um, Heart of Darkness and Tropical Medicine and Quinine, and I was talking about Quinine as a weapon of empire. Um, and he gave me this really good feedback that said, like, you know, the most recent uh, medical historical work has actually been talking about um, mosquito nets and hygiene practices rather than Quinine. And so the deal was, I was reading uh, his uh, medical monograph from like seven years ago, mm -hmm. and I wasn't really caught up with the field of the history of tropical medicine, even more specific. So that kind of freaked me out, but also kind of made me try to become vigilant. Um, and the same, I had the same feeling again when I started to cite more work in epidemiology, public health, uh, microbiology, um, to do this work that I've been doing on antibiotics. And I, w I always had really generous colleagues. Um, that I could call and just be like, hey, is this, you know, is this right? Is my characterization of this correct and accurate? Is it just, or is this a good study to cite? Like, it looks statistically significant, and I Google that, and this this, this p-value is below five, so it looks good. Like, is this okay? <laughs> so I kept doing that all the time, and um, I, you know, one, wanted to stop, like, drawing on other people's generosity all the time, but two, wanted to really feel like I, I was qualified to speak about something that um, is has a really interesting and problematic past. And, you know, as we know, the past is never really the past, um, but, but something that's actively affecting our lives right now and will in the future much, you know, in, in the way that we talk about um, the, uh, the history of racism and slavery and much in the same way that we talk about um, climate change. I really wanted to um, do it accurately, and, and then if I wanted to speak to audiences beyond people that were just interested in literature and medicine and medicine and history, but if I wanted to speak to epidemiologists or people that do public health or people that do public policy, I wanted to be conversant in their language, and that's when I kind of made that commitment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I can't um, help but, you know, Think about the connections <laughs> obviously that the this work that you're doing like and the timing of all of this with the context of COVID. i mean that this must just be kind of a wild time for you to be so steeped in this already from your your you know these discourses from your your dissertation expertise and, and transforming that into a book and then and then going headfirst into this this master's in public health um program so i'm just wondering like what what how are the different pieces coming together i mean it, it for you or like it seems like this is like super relevant stuff right to think be thinking about the history of of, of this um this in the in in our present moment like you don't have to make a case for relevancy because it's almost like too obvious so i'm just yeah, wondering how you how you're piecing that together well that that's that's interesting because um particularly uh, around covid you know before COVID, I'd been talking a long time, and, and I wasn't the only one, of course, that like, you know, we had this way of talking about medicine as war, and it has a history, and it's problematic, and like, as soon as like COVID happened, and, you know, we had a, a particularly um, 
problematic nationalist response. And, you know, the Marshall metaphor became so visible that, like, everybody was talking about it. And people were writing really good um, op-eds and journalistic articles on it, um, uh, Ed Young in particular in The Atlantic. Um, but there was just some, like, really good takes on it. And, like, on the one hand, I was a little jealous because um, I was like, I've been working on this for five years. But then it immediately became relevant. And the stakes of it, like, literally the lives um, started to kind of weigh on me in a really difficult way. Not mm. not that I felt that I was responsible, but um, it's it's when I started talking, when I was um, thinking about, like, the problematic language of collateral damage and, you know, um, I, uh, I ended up writing a piece for uh, Somatosphere, an STS um, online journal, um, and I was thinking about um, these signs. I would say uh, that would say thank you for your sacrifice to, you know, all the frontline healthcare workers, and you know that that kind of started to be gut wrenching because, of course, this was around the same time that, like, you know, the social determinants of health started to become like a word that more people knew, also mm. outside of public health and outside of people who studied race and inequality. Um, so it it became really gut wrenching that some of these things um, from fiction and that happened historically, like were were happening so quickly and visually, um, that the relevancy, um, to be honest with you, was not did did not did not feel good to deal with. And I ended mm. up writing an epilogue about it um, because I just didn't know how to how to deal with it. Yeah, and I'm I'm curious too. I mean, it's like here, you know, with, with UVC, we're really trying to um, kind of make connections, right, and, and bring out um, this emphasis on on race and racism and histories of race and racism and in in and colonialism and empire in in our period and kind of really bring that to the fore, right? And um, and so I'm just kind of curious how you know, given your your expertise in training as a Victorianist, thinking about you know the, those first seeds in Susan's book, right, which is about opium and which is so highly racialized. Like you know, what what is it? How are you seeing that? Really, um, what kinds of connections are are you seeing, right? As as you're you're kind of talking about this with with colleagues who are are thinking about these issues today. Um, well, in terms of antibiotics, I think the most interesting connection uh, I'm seeing there is one um, around uh, rational use and irrational use and how that becomes sort of like the fix, like we develop a protocol and if you use them rationally and if you have proper diagnostic techniques, mm. like, you know, we can ration them accordingly. Um, but of course, like in Zimbabwe and Uganda and, um, you know, other parts of Africa or um, in Thailand, like, you know, they're used irrationally. There are gray markets. And that becomes a lot of the discourse. Mm. Um, and a lot of the kind of ways that race was naturalized. Um, in, uh, and unfortunately, I think even in, in the ways that they're doing it in, um, with good intentions in, in global health and public health. Um, it, it, it often is inflected in really pro problematic ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of this has to do with the way that um, there are long histories of empire and colonialism that have shaped how disease and health is parceled out, distributed, and how the frequency of it in certain places, but that has just become naturalized. So like, you know, tuberculosis used to be endemic to Britain. It used to be endemic to the United States, particularly the Southern United States. Um, but it's endemic to, you know, uh, India or certain parts of, uh, of Africa. And we just naturalize it as such as being, mm -hmm. this is a disease of the place. It's endemic, it's no longer epidemic. Um, so I, I often see the, the uh, um, what I can contribute is asking about like, well, what's the assumption or what's the, what's how did we come to this like naturalization of this idea? Yeah. Um, and a lot of it going back to how um, tropical medicine was so foundational to the expansion of the scramble for Africa, and then sort of got reinflected in a less negative, ostensibly negative inflection in the 20th century, and then got wrapped up um, with uh, global health. Um, we still see sort of histories of white of the white man's burden, but. We also see like really, I, I think a lot of sort of narratives and um, uh, power relations that are, are really easy for us to see and are really easy for students to see in Victorian literature, you know, by way of a kind of cognitive estrangement, but it's, it's harder for us to see in the present. Um, but 
um, I think using um, sort of history and the kind of um, continuity of power structures um, and inequality, particularly around race, um, is, is, is a way to kind of put pressure on how that's working in the present. Mm -hmm. And rather not just saying like, look, somebody made a mistake at one point, and that's how we got here, and we just won't make that mistake again. Like, you know, eugenics, you know, like we learn about the Holocaust and we learn about like eugenics and we won't do that again. And, you know, that's that's the wrong lesson to learn from that. We won't do the Tuskegee experiment again because we learned about it and we yeah. won't, won't do it. But, you know, the same kind of thing still happens in different forms because mm -hmm. the structure is still there. And in fact, because it's less ostensibly visible, in some ways it's more insidious and harder to see. Although COVID, of course, kind of like retrenched that back and brought back all these things that we thought were ostensibly from the past back to the present. Yeah. Um, and this happened not just um, for people who are, you know, of marginalized communities who perpetually have experienced this, but, you know, people of privilege who hadn't had their um, rights and kind of um, lives in feelings of precarity um, in, in, in way, hadn't experienced that in ways that other people hadn't it all of a sudden kind of very much came to the fore. Yeah. Now, surprisingly, and I don't, I certainly would have never imagined this in the, in any version of an uh, apocalyptic or science fiction novel or anything, the way it played out, the way it played out that not, it did, everybody didn't get on board or it's, it's kind of, there's been such resistance still along the way. I, I would have never imagined that. Yeah. Um, so, I think maybe I deviated from uh, your question a little bit. No, but. no, no, that's great. And I mean, I guess, you know, as to, as we kind of think about wrapping up the conversation soon here, I mean, how do you bring this into the classroom with, with your students? I mean, what are some of the things that, um, you know, especially in your classes on, on the 19th century, like, how do you bring this in? You know, how do you raise these discussions? What are, what are they bringing to the classroom and the kinds of connections that they're, they're making? I think um, since, uh, most of the students I teach are actually not English students. Most of my class, most of my teaching goes in our health medicine society program. So usually they're um, psych majors, bio majors. Um, we're getting a lot of international relations majors, um, but they're all double majors in something, something sciencey, and then health medicine and society. So they already have a kind of interdisciplinary mindset. Um, but one thing I try to do with my students is have them always try to bring their trained disciplinary perspective you know, whether it be anthropology or sociology or psychology, bring that to bear on what we're doing. Um, so I'll learn something kind of selfishly, mm -hmm. but it certainly uh, contributes to the conversation. Um, so that's one way I kind of raise um, disciplining and undisciplining uh, in the classroom. With regards to race and inequality, um, uh, as I mentioned, with historical things, particularly something like Dracula, for instance, it's very, it's not hard for students to see. And once they kind of get familiar with the tropes and, you know, the, in, particularly in Victorian studies, the racialization of, of class in, in Victorian England or um, sort of like the, um, uh, xeno, how xenophobia is medicalized as disease. I mean, it's like readily apparent. But, you know, once they read that, that sort of translates to seeing how it happens now. And it just wasn't visible. And it's still still remains. Um, so um, I think the, the kind of cognitive estrangement happens. Um, usually I do it by teaching um, both the fiction along with biomedical prose from the period, so medical articles mm -hmm. um, from the period and um, seeing how they can apply uh, literary techniques to, to reading whatever story might be emerging from there or the figurative language that they use. And uh, ultimately, like in some of the final um, uh, work in the classroom, we'll try to take a more contemporary article that might be doing this kind of stuff, um, particularly around, say, the social determinants of health and talking about something like um, uh, uh, racial um, markers of racial difference or race correction. And the same kind of work of naturalization or flattening of race, um, ostensibly even under good intentions, um, they can start to see the operation of language and assumptions and history, when they start to look at citations, mm. when we start to look at that kind of stuff, we can just see how things get entrenched in biomedical discourse and then in public imaginary by sort of doing the, the close reading and the historical research and the bibliographic work that we train them to do. Um, 
And that's kind of how I um, bring it into the classroom. And uh, I get really frustrated now because do your own research has taken on a really bad um, uh, connotation these days. But like, you know, look at the citations and if they're, you know, citing something about race and it's from like 1957, um, like if we're looking at uh, asthma correction, uh, there, there's a wonderful book here I have to pitch. Um, it's Lundy Braun's uh, Breathing Race into the Machine mm. um, that I often teach in that class for medical humanities. And it's about the history of the spirometer, which actually starts in England um, to be used in insurance and as a, as a kind of classist thing, but then it gets transplanted to the United States and it's used um, to kind of make a difference between black lungs and white lungs. And these kind of statistics stayed around and uh, remain cited and ended up be, continued to be hardwired into spirometers um, used today. And um, so race correction, um, particularly around medical algorithms is something I kind of finish on often. And we can see a sort of um, practical, identifiable, tangible, and something we can do about um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, something that we can do is something that we can um, um, grasp our hand on and see and mm -hmm. critique and maybe change in a positive way. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, I love that. I mean, I think, I think, you know, thinking about kind of where your students are at and encouraging them to to bring those areas of, of expertise into the classroom. You know, even if even if we're teaching more literary class, right? Like we we don't always have just majors in in, in the, those those classes, and and so how that knowledge can be brought in, right? And then and then we can see that in connection to these long histories of um, of discourse. I, I really I really love thinking about that. Um, I think that's probably my my favorite thing um, because I, I do see students then get excited about teaching and showing um, and very honestly it almost always like gives me something new to think about about the th same thing that I've taught like a hundred times mm -hmm. um, um, and in some ways actually like reverses um, some of my assumptions um, and it's just it, it's been the best part of teaching I think. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, I think that's that's a great place to end. Um, and I think, um, you know, I, I've definitely learned a lot in our conversation. So I thank you. I thank you for that. I'm already thinking about, you know, just how we can incorporate um, some of these materials into into our classrooms so that we can make these really urgent connections to the present moment and, and some of the kinds of moves um, that we, we can. So thank you for helping me and, and all of the people who are listening uh, with that learning um, and for your time. Oh, you're so, welcome. Yeah. I, so. have to, uh, I, I would say likewise, um, you know, with, of course, your issue. Um, and the continued work on your sites and just the continued imperative of this um, remaining as like a permanent uh, structure of our field, um, you know, that might not be so uh, perfectly, well, not that I ever was perfectly delimited, but um, that we keep uh, pushing and muddling the boundaries in productive ways. Great, absolutely. So, well, thanks, Lorenzo. Take care. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> thanks.